I'm Ross Wiener, Executive Director of the Aspen Institute's Education and Society Program, and I'm just going to uh, introduce this session very briefly and uh, turn it over to Jim and Jonah. Um, so before I do, I just wanted to say, you know, following education policy over these last couple of years has really been quite a roller coaster. There's a, a, a tremendous amount has gone on, um, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll find out over the coming years uh, what of it uh, was productive. Uh, and one of it we should have uh, thought uh, more about even at the time. But I think we've got a really unique opportunity to learn from what's just gone on in Illinois over these last you know, few months and, and year, um, because it really is quite a different model uh, than what we've seen. You know, and the, we saw so many headlines about Wisconsin and the sit-ins and the protests and the, just the really heated, polarizing nature of so many of the education policy debates that have gone on in the last couple of years. And Illinois really took quite a different tack, and it was sort of an all hands on deck, everybody's in the room, we got to figure this out uh, because we need to do better uh, for our kids. And so I think there's really a lot to learn from, and you know, hopefully, I think there's, a, there's an open question, but I think there's a, something hopeful about the kind of collaboration we've still seen in Illinois about the possibilities now that it's time for implementation. So really excited to learn uh, from these two folks who were prime actors in this drama. So uh, we'll turn it over in a minute to uh, Jim Crown, who is uh, a trustee of the Aspen Institute and uh, sort of, uh, you know, very involved in education and civic matters um, in Chicago, and Jonah Edelman, the co-founder and CEO of Stand for Children, an advocacy organization around improving public education uh, that's sort of uh, in nine states across the country. Is that right? So we're thrilled that you're here. Thanks for coming to Ideas Festival, and I'll turn it over to you. So thank you, thanks for that introduction, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, and uh, we put this forward as a uh, education-centric uh, session. Uh, this is really going to be uh, an hour about politics and political action. Uh, and uh, so there, there might have been a little uh, uh, camouflage in the titling because uh, while the, the nobility of the outcome, we hope, is something that we can all be proud of. Uh, what you're really about to hear, what happened in Illinois, is, is a story of, of fairly uh, straightforward, uh, very uh, rudimentary political activism. And uh, it could apply to things other than education. In this case, it applied, importantly, to the educational system in Illinois and in Chicago. Um, and uh, it, it really was. Uh, thanks to Jonah and one other person, that Illinois went from having uh, one of the worst, worst statutory environments for education reform to what is, uh, we hope, a model for virtually all the other states. And uh, while this subject might sound very local to some, you know, education reform in Illinois, uh, I think this, the Senate Bill 7 that was just signed by the governor a little while ago might well be regarded as the most important uh, new model for uh, legislative reform and education reform in any of the 50 states. Um, I want to set the context before handing it over to Jonah to describe what we were up against and, and what the environment was. And the, uh, the way to set the context really is to blend three streams of uh, recent history uh, because it, it, all these things are complicated. Uh, let's talk about what the educational system looked like in Chicago. Um, 675 schools, 122 of them were our high schools. Uh, we have 71 charters. Um, the school system is the second largest employer in the city with over 40,000 employees. About 25,000 of them are teachers, all unionized. Uh, the budget is fairly substantial. It's the, it's the third largest school system in the country. It has a $5.3 billion budget, and right now we're running a projected $700 million deficit. Um, so those are kind of just uh, bare facts. Uh, how is that school system performing? Uh, in a word, awful. Uh, and and uh, people remember it as being a poster child uh, many years back for uh, the failure of inner city public schools. Uh, we have the shortest school day of any major public school system. And when Rahm Emanuel was running, he liked telling anecdotally the story of a uh, kindergartner in Houston public schools and a kindergartner in Chicago public schools, by the time they re receive their diploma, if they do, as seniors, the Houston public school student will have been in front of a teacher four years more than the Chicago public school. Imagine missing four years of face time with teachers because of the length of the school year and the length of the school day. Um, 
uh, the, the dire statistics go on. Um, uh, less than half of the high school people who show up for high school graduate in five years, um, and uh, only 8%, 8% of students who start as freshmen in a Chicago public high school will graduate a four-year college by the time they're 25. And if you're an African-American male, that number is 3%. So th think of the human capital loss when 97% of the African-American males that start in the Chicago public school system have no statistical shot at coming out of a four-year college uh, with a degree. Um, teacher quality, another very interesting statistics. Those of you that are close to academic institutions know that uh, state schools, uh, uh, education officers talk about an ACT score of 20 is, is a uh, kind of a floor for being able to succeed at a decent four-year college. The average ACT score of Chicago Public High School teachers is 19. And that includes the up average we now have because we have a strong Teach for America core in those numbers. It was lower than that before TFA was folded in. So that's the school system. What was the political context? Um, Illinois is, uh, I think everybody's observed in the last couple of years, a pretty blue state. Um, and uh, a history of either liberal Democratic governors or occasionally governors who use the state house as a way station to federal prison. Um, <laughs> and um, either way, it, it has not had strong. Uh, it has not had strong executive leadership, uh, and it has uh, had a dominant voice from the well mobilized and well organized political action groups, including unions, and especially uh, the teachers unions, which are quite strong throughout the state of Illinois and in Chicago. Uh, we do have a very strong uh, speaker, uh, uh, Speaker Madigan. Mike Madigan is uh, probably the most powerful political person in the state, frankly, in terms of uh, being able to make things happen. Uh, but he's a political pragmatist, and the unions historically have been very well mobilized politically to uh, pursue their agenda. And um, they were always there in every campaign cycle, over four and a half million of contributions going back to 2000. And uh, they knew what they were doing and did it well over, over the time period. So basically, um, they, they had uh, the, the best shot at writing the rules. So what did that give us? Um, there actually is one more state in Illinois, then one more state in the union that is more strike permissive than Illinois was. Anybody want to guess what it was? Vermont. All the public school students in Vermont would fit in two high schools in Chicago. But Vermont is the only state in the union that had a more permissive strike regime than Illinois did. Now, there are a couple that were almost as permissive, Hawaii, Minnesota, and Montana. But uh, people talk about right to strike. Uh, we referenced Wisconsin and what happened there. Um, it, it is a well-accepted uh, political concept, I think, in this country. Uh, teachers, or not teachers, firefighters, policemen, um, flight attendants. Some people have to mediate, can't strike, and in fact, in 45 of the 50 states, there is no right to strike by teachers. 39 have absolutely no right to strike, and, and six others require fact-finding first. So this was an incredibly strike-permissive environment with these other um, efforts uh, uh, by the unions and so forth that, that uh, created a unsustainable structure in our school system. Um, people might also, especially in, in this environment, be aware, you know, we had a mayor who talked uh, importantly about reforming the schools, Mayor Daley, and we had a uh, CEO of public schools, Arnie Duncan, who did everything he could in that environment. But this was not a fair fight because of the uh, political strength and the organized strength of the unions who, each time they came up to a contract session, would not concede on a length of day, would not concede on teacher metrics, and would insist on uh, additional compensation. And that's the way things have gone for an entire generation in terms of um, negotiated outcome. Uh, one last bit of uh, context before I uh, ask Jonah to describe what we did with that circumstance. Um, Chicago has a very engaged uh, private citizen community that wants to make the city better. Uh, those of us that live in Chicago are extraordinarily proud of how engaged and committed people are to civic leadership across all domains. This includes education. And um, education 
received a lot of funding, a lot of attention, and it was from virtually every corner uh, uh, that you could imagine. It was corporations, it was civic organizations, it was the private sector, it was foundations. Um, but I feel like a lot of what we did there was, I, I don't want to make it sound marginal by saying it was at the margin, but it was something outside the core structure. It was not structural change. It was the charter schools. It was bringing in Teach for America. It was bringing specific programs of human enrichment as an overlay on um, what was basically there. And I have to say, working at the edge like that for some people was getting to be quite frustrating and frankly quite discouraging. I, I have a couple friends, uh, they speak with a bit of hyperbole, but they will say things like, you know, I've put thousands of hours and millions of dollars into this, we have accomplished nothing, I'm done here. And uh, were we really at an inflection point when Rahm Emanuel was elected? I don't know. Were we really at an inflection point when this bill came up? I don't know. But people were talking about it like, okay, we will give this one more shot with our philanthropic dollars and with our time. And if we can't get it right this time, I'm going to put my efforts and money into something where I can actually live to see the benefit. Because people were, were quite frustrated with the benefit they weren't seeing uh, up until then. So into that maelstrom walks Jonah Edelman. Uh, and you heard a little bit about Jonah, uh, Stand for Children, um, uh, was organized in, uh, well, I guess DC was the first place you worked, but, but it's based out of Oregon. And uh, Jonah, uh, through some mutual friends, approached several of us who had been in working on this to talk about how he thought maybe he could help make things different. Uh, and uh, he was quite persuasive that he could, and, and so we'll move to having him explain exactly what that was. I, I guess I just will uh, give you a little bit of a commercial because uh, if you look at the website, it does have a rather moving phrase about uh, where the name comes from, and it was a quote from Rosa Parks, who was part of your Washington, D.C. Uh, event, who said, if I can sit for justice, you can stand for children. Um, and that is, the or that is the credo of the organization, and Jonah, why don't you t talk a bit about what you did. Thank you all very much for coming. There were a few positives I want to point out. Um, Jim hit the political context uh, squarely on the head. Uh, a few things that are also important to note. An organization called Advance Illinois, uh, which some of you may know about, was founded a few years before uh, Stan came to Illinois by the Joyce Foundation and the Gates Foundation. And it's a terrific organization led by a wonderful leader, Robin Staines. And it's very strong on policy advocacy. Uh, had Bill Daly as the co-chair before he went to the White House, and Jim Edgar as former governor. So that's a great asset uh, in that state. And they had led a process, which was collaborative, to establish a better way of evaluating teachers. The catalyst for that was federal race to the top money, which you might have been aware of. Are you aware of the race to the top um, competition where Arnie Duncan um, put together you know, $4 billion, let states bid? You know, um, great catalyst for change. And Illinois basically went as far as its politics would allow it by coming up with a new way of evaluating teachers. No consequences, but a good first step. And I think it's really important to mention. So coming to town, um, I was aware of, of that, and I was also aware of the entrenchment. And frankly, when Bruce Rauner, uh, who's a mutual friend of uh, Jim's and probably many of you in this room, who's been involved in education for many years, uh, asked after seeing that we passed legislation in several states, including Colorado, um, that we look at Illinois, I was, I was skeptical. Um, and after interviewing 55 uh, different folks in the landscape, Speaker of the House, Senate President, Minority Leadership, Education Advocates, um, met with Jim and many others, um, was very surprised to see that there was a, a tremendous political opening that I think Bruce wasn't even aware of. And that was that the Illinois Federation of Teachers, uh, still inexplicably, went to war with Speaker Madigan, who Jim cited as a very, very powerful uh, figure, who had been Speaker for 27 years, uh, with the exception of a couple of years between 94 and 96, over an incremental pension reform. Uh, and Jim and many others are diehard advocates for pension reform in Illinois, and, and the pension reform that happened in 2010 is not the reform that's needed in Illinois, but it was a first step, only affecting future employees. The union could well have, probably definitely should have, thanked Madigan for not going further. Instead, they um, decided that the $2 million they had been giving him reliably for um, election campaigns, um, that they would take that away. 
that they would uh, refuse to endorse any Democrat who voted for that legislation, even those that had been loyal supporters for years. And they went to the AFL-CIO and tried to get them to do the same. Um, so a major breach, uh, and it's something just as you're kind of starting to think of ways in which the context in Illinois is similar to other states, you're starting to see that in other states where Democrats are, who are still in control are having to address these terrible fiscal issues, and in so doing, there's often conflicts that are arising. So there's this breach, and um, uh, stand um, with the support of Jim, um, Brian Simmons, um, and a few others, uh, Ken Griffin. Uh, well, actually, initially, it was uh, Jim, Matt Holsizer, Paul Finnegan. We decided to get involved in midterm elections, which many advise us against doing because we're new to town, we don't know the landscape. But my position was we had to be involved to show our capability to build some clout. So we very quickly researched the situation. And while there was a lot of folks, I think, um, who thought that the Republicans were going to take over um, in Illinois, uh, our analysis was that Madigan would still be speaker. And that was, you know, district by district, um, dispassionate. Um, that wasn't what I think a lot of our colleagues wanted to hear. This was in one of the one of the several spikes of Blagojevich indictment uh, headlines, and so no, seriously, as, as a political flow, you would have bet against people running uh, in his shadow. That's exactly right. Um, and there's obviously a red wave um, last cycle, and so our analysis was he was still going to be in power, and as such, the raw politics of it were that we should tilt toward him. And so we interviewed 36 candidates in targeted races. And essentially, I'm being quite blunt here, um, the individual candidates were essentially a vehicle to, to um, execute a political objective, which was to tilt toward Madigan. So the press never picked up on it. We endorsed nine individuals, um, and uh, six of them were Democrats, three Republicans, and tilted our money toward Madigan, who was expecting, because of Bruce Rauner's leadership, and uh, Bruce is a Republican, that all of our money was going to go to Republicans. Um, uh, that that was really a show of uh, an indication to him that we could be a new partner to take the place of the Illinois Federation of Teachers. That was the point. Um, luckily, it never got covered that way. Um, that wouldn't work well um, in Illinois. Madigan's not particularly well uh, liked. Um, and um, it did work. After the election, um, Advance Illinois and Stan had drafted a very bold proposal we called Performance Counts. It tied tenure and layoffs to performance. It let principals hire who they choose. It streamlined dismissal of ineffective tenured teachers substantially, from two plus years, 200,000 plus in legal fees on average, to three to four months, with very uh, little likelihood of legal recourse. And most importantly, uh, we called for the reform of collective bargaining throughout the state, essentially proposing that school boards would be able to decide any disputed issue at impasse. So a very, very bold proposal for Illinois, and one that six months earlier would have been unthinkable, undiscussable. Now, after the election, I went back to Madigan, and I confirmed, reviewed the proposal that we had already discussed, and I confirmed his support. He said he was supportive. The next day, he created an education reform committee, and his political director called to ask for our suggestions of who should be on it. And so in Aurora, Illinois, in December, out of nowhere, there are hearings on our proposal. In addition, we hired 11 lobbyists, including four of the absolute best insiders and seven of the best minority lobbyists, preventing the unions from hiring them. We enlisted a statewide public affairs firm. We had tens of thousands of supporters. And with Jim's and many others stepping up, Paula and Steve, thank you, we raised $3 million for our political action committee between the election and the end of the year. That's more money than either of the unions have in their political action committees. And so essentially what we did in a very short period of time was shift the balance of power. And I can tell you there was a palpable sense of concern, if not shock, on the part of the teachers unions in Illinois that Speaker Madigan had changed um, allegiance and that we had clear political capability to potentially jam this proposal down their throats the same way pension reform had been jammed down their throats six months earlier. In fact, the pension reform was called Senate Bill 1946, and the unions took to talking to each other about, we're not going to let ourselves be 1946 again, using it as a verb. Uh, and so um, in, the short se in what's called um, lame duck session in January, called lame duck session because some lame ducks are allowed to take a last vote for a politically difficult 
um, uh, topics, proposals. We made an attempt to do just that. And we weren't able to move our proposal. Um, and my analysis to Jim and others was that it went a little too far for Illinois. Um, but as you'll see in just a second, it was an effective starting point because we started extremely, gave ourselves some room to come back. Senator Kimberly Lightford, who's been a reliable supporter of unions and in the middle of education um, policymaking, uh, intervened. She has a lot of clout in the Senate. She helped elect the Senate President, John Cullerton, and she forced groups to the table. The unions were thrilled to come to the table and to discuss things that, again, nine months earlier, they would not have been willing to discuss. And so over the course of three months, with Advance Illinois taking the negotiating lead, my colleague Jessica Handy, our policy director in the room for every meeting, and, and Advance and Stan working in lockstep, and that unity is so important, that partnership, caucusing before every meeting, caucusing after every meeting, making plans, um, they essentially gave away every single provision uh, related to teacher effectiveness that we had proposed. Everything we fought for in Colorado down to the last half hour of the legislative session, they gave us at the negotiating table. Not irrationally, not idealistically. It wasn't a change of heart. It's because they feared that we were able to potentially execute our collective bargaining proposal, enact that. And unions are more very logical. Um, they're concerned most about their dues and their membership. And then next up, collective bargaining, and pensions are somewhere right around there. And then teacher effectiveness reform, you know, issues, tenure, layoffs, compensation, that's tertiary for them. So if you show the capability to actually enact, enact collective bargaining reforms, they're logically going to give on everything short of that to pull back the barricades. And so this was the strategy led by the IEA. And I should note, the <coughs> Illinois Education Association, which is the downstate union, which is the better resourced union with more members, is, has a history of pragmatism. And, and they led on this negotiation. They really kind of brought the other unions along. Joe Anderson, the former head of uh, the Illinois Education Association, now works with Arnie Duncan in the Department of Ed. And his son, Josh, is the head of Teacher America in Chicago. And the new director, Audrey Soglin, is very pragmatic. Um, I, I, I doubt this tape will ever get to her. Um, but uh, I would say that I'm interested in talking at some point about whether or not she at the end of the day would, um, was happy to get these issues resolved. I don't think she liked defending a seniority-based system. So in the intervening, um, that intervening time, Rahm Emanuel is elected mayor on the first ballot, and he strongly supports our proposal. Jim talked about the talking point that we made up and he repeated a thousand times probably on the campaign trail about Houston kids going to school four years more than uh, Chicago kids. That was another shoe that dropped. And it really um, put a lot of pressure on the unions, particularly the Chicago Teachers Union, because they didn't support them. So here's what ends up happening at the end of the day. April 12th, we're down to the last topic of collective bargaining. It's been saved for last. It's the hardest topic. We fully expected that we would, our collaborative problem solving of three months would end. And we would have an impasse and, and go to war. And we were prepared. We had m money raised for radio ads. and and our lobbyists were ready. Well, to our surprise, and with Rahm Emanuel's involvement behind the scenes, we were able to split the IEA from the, the Chicago Teachers Union. And in January, just after we hadn't gotten our proposal through in the, in the lame duck session, I'd worked with a labor lawyer named Jim Franzik, who's absolutely brilliant, um, if any of you know him, and his partner um, of counsel, Stephanie Donovan, on fallbacks. And Jim and the other supporters had approved fallbacks from our initial proposal essentially isolating Chicago and calling for binding arbitration or uh, fact-finding proposal, fact-finding process that wasn't binding but would have a high threshold for unions to approve. We came with a fallback of binding arbitration when we saw that the Illinois Education Association was going to do a deal and just focus on Chicago. They, interestingly, pressured the Chicago Teachers Union to take the deal. Karen Lewis, the head of the Chicago Teachers Union, who's a diehard militant, was focused on maintaining her sense of her members' right to strike. Her sense was that binding arbitration was um, giving away the right to strike. But our next proposal, our next best, which was a very high threshold for strikes, for whatever reason, tactical miscalculation on her part, was palatable. Rom pushed it. Kimberly Lightford pushed it. We'd done our homework. We knew that the highest threshold of any 
bargaining unit that had voted one way or the other on a collective bargaining um, agreement on a contract vote was 48.3%. The threshold that we were arguing for was three quarters. So in effect, they wouldn't have the ability to strike even though the right was maintained. And so at the end, in the end game, the Chicago Teachers Union took that deal, misunderstanding, probably not knowing the statistics about voting history. And the length of day and year was no longer bargainable in Chicago. And we insisted that we decide all the fine print about the process. She was happy to let us do that. With the unions then on board, they were relieved, the IEA and the IFT were relieved to have a deal. They came out strongly in support of this agreement, which was this wholesale you know, transformational change. And with that support, there was no reason for any politician to oppose it. So the Senate backed it 15 to 9 to 0. And then the Chicago Teachers Union leader started getting pushback from her, um, her membership for a deal that really probably wasn't, from their perspective, strategic. She backed off for a little while, but she had already died in cash. She'd publicly been supportive. So we did some face-saving technical fixes um, in a separate bill, but the House approved 112 to 1. And a liberal Democratic governor who was elected by public sector unions, that's not even a debatable fact, signed it and took credit for it. So we talk about you know, a, a process that ends up um, achieving transformational change. It's going to allow the, next, the new mayor and the new CEO to lengthen the day and year as much as they want. The unions cannot strike in Chicago. They will never be able to muster the 75% threshold necessary to strike. And the whole framework for discussing impact, you know, what compensation is necessary, is set up through the fine print that we approved to ensure that the fact-finding recommendations, which are non-binding, will favor what we would consider to be common sense. So that's what happened. And um, you know, um, we're really happy to open this, but we, we're talking about an opportunity now for transformational change across Illinois in that principals will have the power to dismiss ineffective teachers, that they'll be able to hire who they want, that they'll no longer be forced to accept teachers they don't want in their buildings, and that when layoffs happen, they'll be able to let people go based on performance, not just seniority. And then in Chicago, they'll be able to lengthen their day and year, which has been just a horrible in inequity um, for decades. Uh, and all this with the narrative of union leadership because it was a fait accompli and the unions decided smartly that they would pursue a win-win. We gave them the space to win. We've been happy to dole out plenty of credit. And now it makes it hard for folks leading unions in other states to say this is, these types of reforms are terrible because their colleagues in Illinois have just said these are great. So our hope and our expectation is to use this as a catalyst to very quickly make change, similar changes in other very entrenched states. That's the overview of what happened. Thank you. Jonah, thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm going to make four uh, summary points, and then we will throw it open to questions and uh, dialogue, and uh, be very interested to hear how, how people are reacting to this based on uh, where, where you're coming from. Um, observations I would make are that, uh, obviously, special interest politics are alive and well in America. And uh, the point isn't whether they are good or bad, it's whether or not they're well organized, well funded, and have a noble goal. Um, but this was special interest politics. What was unusual, I think, is that there was actually never a special interest advocacy group that was focused on pro-children education reform. There was not a special interest for that cause. And that one did develop uh, was uh, instrumental. Also, obviously, this had to be a financial and political priority. Uh, we all have our, finan or our political priorities when we go to the ballot box. It can be taxes, choice, regulation, the role of government. This seems to be important to everybody, but not uh, a decision point for what candidates they really back. And until that happened this election cycle this way, it was going to be like complaining about airline food. Everybody may do it, but unless you change your choice of airlines because of it, they're not going to change their food. It's going to be price and schedule, which uh, data shows people react to what uh, the customer actually is asking for. And 
The last thing I'll mention, and this was a bit of the uh, the epiphany that it, it occurred, at least for me and, and, and some others that were very much a part of this effort. Jonas mentioned several, but not all. Um, we were very proud of what we were doing as a family in Chicago, uh, as, as a philanthropy, as, as, as citizens. But we had to take our fight where the fight was. We had never gone to Springfield with these issues, you know, principals, schools, mayors, yes, but we had never gone where the fight was. And I think until you take this to where the fight is, you're going to end up with the cycle that we endured for a generation and the frustration we did. And so we're, we're very pleased that we finally got uh, cracked the code on that one. So with that, uh, love to hear your questions and comments. Yes, right here. College ready high school graduation. Um, and then, you know, leading to that, it's children who are on track. Now, we're going to get into broader topics of problems in American public education here. So there's, it's opaque. You know, there's just not enough clarity about who's on track and who's not. Every state defines their own graduation standards and they have their own assessments. Um, you know, I think one of the things we could do collectively that make the most difference is, in whatever way you can, ensure that the common core standards common standards across the country for high school graduation are implemented and that the assessments that go along with those standards are executed and, and, and they go into effect. And there's a common definition of a kid who's on track and who's not, and more transparency. That's the bottom line. But the statistics that Jim cited have to change. If they don't, then what we've done accomplishes has accomplished nothing. Okay. Okay, I'm not sure who the U is in that sentence. <laughs> Stand for children in advance. Oh, you can so, speak. Uh, absolutely, we're building an affiliate for the long term. We have a great staff already. Um, there has to be a statewide constituency of parents and educators, and there has to be a very, very um, proactive strategy in Chicago and outside Chicago. Our first focus in Chicago is going to be ensuring that district is able to follow through on the instructional time um, increase. Now, while the rules allow the mayor to increase instructional time, it can't become something that's a terrible issue for him politically. So we have to mobilize, organize and mobilize the support to make it a winner politically. Um, so we'll be there to support the mayor in that. We also want to get parents engaged in the topic because top-down change only without an educated uh, group of consumers only goes so far. Um, so we're hoping to have tens of thousands in a discussion around how time should be used in Chicago, so that when the mayor comes forward, be it September or next spring, to enact a longer day in year, that there is a community groundswell of support. predict uh, some more turbulence on this topic uh, and it's hard for uh, us to see just as citizens of Chicago how they're going to solve this. We've got a new school board, we've got a new CEO of public schools. They are working this, they're disaggregating it and they figured out 15 million here and 22 million there um, and, and uh, it seems to me like we will end up operating in the red for a while. I'm not quite sure how that works as a matter of cash management. But um, they have got uh, a, a serious uphill problem, and the they in this case is the school board and the political administration, and, and how the mayor is going to deal with that is, is a front and center problem that I, I don't, he will get it down, he won't get it to zero, and uh, that, that may create some, you, you may be hearing about this topic again because of that, uh, and trying to lengthen the day with, with paying people, while paying people no more is obviously going to stress things. <laughs> Um, my forecast in, is in the immediate term, this is now back in the mayor's court and the school board's court to start getting some things in place about principals and metrics and quality schools and, and so forth at, 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 at the CPS level. 
right after that, I think the public sector has, or the private sector has got a great partnership opportunity to come in and do things that will be effective and uh, strategic uh, once this is sorted out. But the ball's on the other side of the net right now for, for the mayor to get stuff done uh, before we can come back in as, as private citizens and truly be helpful, I think. Yeah, right here. Curricular. The Curric question was about whether or not there are curricular reforms, and that's really not been something that. Uh, no, I mean it's, it's something we've encouraged state boards of ed in some states to adopt the Common Core standards, but um, you know we're the lead group on that is Achieve, and they've done, and the chief uh, state school officers and the NGA they've done some great work on it. So Stand isn't involved at that level. Um, I was just in Tennessee a couple weeks ago, and I think there's big questions around how that will play out. Um, obviously, you want a balanced negotiation process where a threat of a strike can't take issues off the table and where you know management needs to have some discussion so there's some ownership and buy-in on the part of the workforce. And you know, I'm, I'm eager to see how that works. I'm also, um, I, I also think there's some possibilities of enacting similar improvements in urban districts in Tennessee as a result of the contract change. In the back. Yes, for sure. I mean, I think it's a question of resources, um, skill, and then unity. I think those are the key ingredients. Um, New York already has a good group called Education Reform Now, and um, I think there's uh, another group that I can't mention that may come in with even more um, forcefulness um, in New York. And so um, for us, it, it's really a question of niche and need. If we're invited there, if there's a group that really wants us to come and there's a niche, we're open to it. Um, this, Illinois has very entrenched politics. There's really no, I mean, there might be a degree of difference with California, probably is the worst, and then New York, but it's really the same. It's you don't want to be in these playoffs, even if you're not going to win. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, and so, it, you know, Massachusetts, um, we, have an, we have nine affiliates, and we're growing to 20 states by the end of 2015. The calculus is always the same for us. It's about whether there's a near-term education reform opportunity, niche, champions, ability to scale and sustain. We're not here to come in, pass a law, and leave. The questions have already been asked. This is about long-term change, and it's from capital to classroom. So New York is certainly a state we could work in if there were a need. The key in New York is you're not going to change the speaker, the, the speaker of the Assembly. Okay? The question is whether or not you can get two-thirds support. And so just as you, you saw an incredible transformation on gay marriage in New York that just happened, you know, both basically the same legislature, different result because of better political strategy and execution. The same can happen on education in New York. What's the future for? Is that going to be next? Um, so, uh, for for those that um, like feeling better about their state finances, um, Illinois has a 113 billion dollar unfunded deficit due to these uh, unfunded entitlements. Uh, we are. Uh, held up against, per taxpayer, the worst, it held up against the ability to generate revenue, the worst, or one of the worst, and we tried, we meaning the state, uh, to go after this in a, in a sort of, um, uh, I would say, moderate intense way uh, before the legislature adjourned. The votes were not there, and they said we'll try and do it over the summer session. So uh, it was deferred for lack of uh, political capital to get it done, whether or not it's deferred further, I don't know. What's happened more recently is that the tax increase that occurred in January, we raised uh, personal and corporate income taxes significantly, has resulted in uh, at least an announced, whether it's, it, it's threats or actual, I don't know, but it's an announced flight 
of corporate headquarters that has had Governor Quinn every day hosting a new corporation, cutting a special tax deal for them. Uh, and so uh, we, we still have got a lot to sort out on the balanced budget in Illinois, and, uh, and the political will is not yet organized enough to get something done. Yes? lost um, you know so I uh, you know I think that's I would disagree with that premise I think um, I think he could still be mayor of DC easily All right and politics is an art uh, politics is an art form and I think when you read accounts of reformers or elected officials who um, try to rule by fiat you know um, and do things without practicing the art of politics, which is labor-intensive, um, relationship-based. Um, you know, I'm from D.C. and I know a lot of people there. And I think you know you got to go to funerals. You got to meet with people. You got to meet with people who backed you. You got to put people in key positions who are going to treat people respectfully. And you know you don't do that. You pay a price politically. And um, he could have done all the educational changes. Um, even in the way that they were done, which really could have been more diplomatic, um, and still won had he, um, you know, done his business politically. That being said, um, you know, our issues poll really well, actually. And um, that's our theory of action, is to focus on issues that the public strongly agrees with, but special interest politics have um, prevented from happening. And use, as Jim said, special interest politics um, on our side. Um, our theory of action doesn't work on issues that don't poll well. And so, you know, and again, we don't come in with a one-size-fits-all to a state, and we don't come in, you know, with the, our finger pointed, you know, ready to poke people in the eye. The, you know, our approach is build as much political clout in the most unassuming, diplomatic way, go for bold change, do it in the most bridge-building possible way. If you see a leader like Audrey Soglin, give her the ability to lead. Give her the space to win. And don't you know play win lose politics? Unfortunately, Washington, Oregon, California, um, you got to play win lose politics because of the way the unions operate. So you can't be shy about that. But it's just it's just operating in a in a fairly disciplined, strategic way at all times, and not saying things just because you want to say them. Um, you know they feel good to say, but they actually aren't strategic when you're trying to achieve a political result. We're not working in D.C. There's a good group called D.C. School Reform Now um, that was founded by one of our board members, Kristen Ergo, that I think very highly of, and we provide some, some technical assistance. Um, and D.C. has some great opportunities. I think Kai Henderson's a terrific leader. I think um, Mayor Gray that is very open. Um, they have a, an incredible um, opportunity with their charter sector in D.C. I mean, it's got some real scale, and if they get their quality issues under control and close some of the bad charters, you can see a lot better results. It could potentially be a model. Jim should talk more about it. I mean, that, that's huge. Yeah. And then, yeah. <clears throat> what are states, and if you can name some, do you think the lessons of them could be replicated? Sure. And finally, just a quick couple. Well, I heard what you said about the, the teacher unions you know, having to sign on, but they got weak. You know, weak means, but it was too late. What are they saying now? Are they sticking to their support after the fact? Absolutely. Um, so, the last question first. The IEA and the IFT 
are thrilled. They're writing op-eds in national publications about you know, Illinois being an education reform leader, not mentioning Stanford children. That's fine. Um, and that's great. It's a great narrative. The bill signing was, I was saying to, to Jim, it was, um, it was a great example of politics in action. You know, Stanford children was hardly mentioned. Um, many of the fathers of that success who were absent for the conception and you know, div you know, gestation um, and birth of the child you know, were claiming credit for paternity. Um, it was terrific. <laughs> And um, that's, that's how it works. Um, so I think this is an enduring change, and the implementation is going to be quite smooth. And the CTU president probably is going to have some trouble based on putting herself in a position where she's got a terrible reputation now in Springfield, and now she's also has some trouble internally. So she's got some challenges. Um, I, I guess the, the comment I'd make about um, the, the $3 million uh, is, is that this was just straightforward pragmatism. I mean, uh, holding aside value judgment, judgments or, or uh, social objectives or, or any, any policy conversation, what, what are the facts? You've got well-organized teachers' unions who have uh, political campaign chests. They have workers who show up in meetings who are mobilized to do what is in their interest. And that is an absolutely uh, standard, conventional, uh, appropriate factor in American politics. There was no counterweight. There was no organized force to have a rational legislator say, you know, well, these guys are helping me in my district, and you guys are giving me lectures about 3% can't go on to college. You know, I realize that, but, you know, my issue is getting elected because uh, I'm not going to solve all these problems between now and November. Um, and so the pragmatic response is we get it. You would like to stay in office. And you would like to stay in office backed by people who then you can uh, pursue that agenda as long as you're finding alignment. So forget the uh, rhetoric, forget the, the speech making that, that we would all do and say, okay, we will have money and it will go to you if you're backing this as a political priority and it will go to the opposite of you if you're not. And um, the... You know, I mean, for you it was a departure. Yeah, we. I mean, there, there, there's there's there, there's a high squirm factor in, in in doing this, right? I mean, you know, you, first of all, you'd, you'd like to think that the merits of the argument are compelling, and second of all, it, candidly, it, this is a fraction of what we've all spent on charter schools and uh, you know uh, scholarships and all these other things. But it was you know, it added up to three hundred million dollars, and it was hundreds of thousands for many of us. And it was all of a sudden check writing that uh, we said, "Okay, we get it. This, 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 the outcome here won't be uh, new computers. It will be this person will be in office, not that person." And uh, you just had to choose that as the as the path you wanted to be on. And you yeah. can't do it in other states. We're already yeah, we're already getting going. I mean, the thing about the way we work is. We, we're doing this level of work in every state that we're in. And so it's not one person. It's significant organizations led by stellar executive directors who operate, operate as CEOs. Um, so in, in Washington state right now, we've got exactly the same goal, and that's another state where it doesn't lack for re financial resources. The question is you know, achieving the same kind of reallocation. Um, we, can, we could readily outspend the Washington Education Association. Massachusetts. Very similar. Um, it might be a ballot measure in, in Washington. It might be we have a ballot measure on the ballot, and we use it as a lever in Massachusetts. But it, so it'll look a little bit different, but it's essentially the same. Iowa is another state. You know, Democratic Senate feel like we could do the same. Very, very major reform potential there. So I, I don't think there's any question. But by the end of this decade, we're going to have. Um, ended seniority-based decision-making in education in this country. That's not enough to ensure better outcomes, but it's certainly something that has been long overdue. Yes. They're going to be able to make their year longer and their day longer. Is the soonest would be January, and it's probably we're talking September 12th. Um, and then you know if you have a longer day but terrible teachers, that doesn't do anything, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Um, 
you know, so it's, it's about performance management. Boring, it's not a silver bullet, but Jean-Claude Broussard needs to hire a lot of really good, what they call chief area officers. He's got to hire a, a lot of really good, like superintendent level people. They're, they'd be overseeing 30, 40 schools. And then they've got to evaluate their principles rigorously and, and, and they need to create much more in the way of pipelines of quality principles. So it's, it's blocking and tackling. But now there's, a, a, as Jim said, a more conducive framework for folks. And I would think that more people would want to be principals because then they realize they actually not only have the accountability, but they have the authority. Yes? So do you want to have the accountability back to you that that happens? I mean, what role do you play? You've invested in all this. Well, OK, so the you now shifts to a citizen of right. Chicago citizen. or uh, and, and these dire statistics, which um, I, I'm glad they, they seem to have some shock value in this room. They've actually had much diminishing, you know, steadily diminishing shock value, which people are just accepting these bad numbers and outcomes as well. Yeah, you know, the weather's tough in January too. Um, uh, we, yes, we would like, we, we are interested in the transparency, we're interested in the metrics, we, we very much would like to see this happen, but, but there's no single organization that can or should feel, they, this, this is all of us, as, as, as a citizen of Chicago or a citizen of the United States, you know, the, as Jonah said a minute ago, you know, the, this conversation pertains to uh, our future as a country, our, our financial well-being, our national security, and all these things are just going to... Uh, meld together if, if this gets better uh, you know we'll, we'll be glad that we were part of helping and getting it getting it a little better um, okay and you, you you you're our last questioner because we're coming to the end of our hour. no I'm glad you actually I'm glad you asked that the Tribune was fantastic the Tribune was, fan I mean, I think they probably wrote what you, more than 10 supportive editorials. Prominent. Prominent. Like, you know, top, you know, top um, well-written. I think Paul Weingarten was um, responsible for a lot of those. Sun-Times was good. Um, we had a lot of downstate um, editorial support. Um, it didn't become a big flashpoint, and so on the news side, it didn't get so much attention. Um, it did, after it passed, get a lot of attention. But... Um, Editorial support was terrific, um, uh, but it, I wouldn't call it a, anywhere near a decisive variable. But it's Wisconsin much. Was all, I think, you know, Wisconsin yeah. was a problem for us. Um, it made it hard for a while, um, but we were able to reframe by doing a side by side, which we sent to all legislators, juxtaposing our legislation from the Wisconsin legislation to make clear that the union's mantra of "this is a Wisconsin style attack" was baloney. Um, but you know, it was it was definitely in a char this is in a charged media environment, so I think. I'd say to come out with this kind of kumbaya narrative um, was even more notable, given the, the main story of polarization in the country. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. <laughs>